And we do hear a lot of questions about you know, the issues around feeding cows. Will quotas that have been abolished mean simply putting in more concentrate for more milk out and hope that the market sustains that and, and returns it? And that's the key issue, I think, is around responses to feeding. What does the base system look like if we're going to do that? And can, can we make some sense of that? Um, I also think there's, there's probably two um, there's probably two different schools of thought on the whole issue of dairy production at this stage. We have, I think it's fair to say, we have guys that feed cows, or perceive themselves to feed cows, and we have guys that manage grass, and never the twain should meet, or never the twain should talk. And I think that's a bit of a tragedy, actually, because I think both sets, both sets of farmers could learn quite a bit from each other. And I think that's important, so I think we should keep that in mind uh, from what I'm going to say for the next few moments. So look at First thing is, we hear a lot about this term modern, modern dairy system, modern dairy cow. We better put some idea of what we actually mean by that to start off. Some basic nutrition guidelines, so the, the people who are interested in feeding cows might be away for this part. Some issues around feeds and different types of feeds, but we don't want to go too, into too much detail maybe. And finally, I think this is an important part, the whole issue around whole farm feed budgets and whole farm stock rates. Now, I know the spring we've just had brought a lot of this to, to bear in terms of feed shortages. There's a huge issue out there in terms of if people are considering expansion, or even if they're not considering expansion, how secure is the whole farm feed budget? Are we, you know, are, is it predictable how the, how the herd will be fed from year to year? And certainly in an expansion scenario, it's going to be very important that we understand clearly where this extra feed is going to come from to feed the extra cows that we intend to, to milk. Okay, so first thing, what do we mean by modern dairy system? And this is a little thing I show quite a bit, and it's all the things that we're used to hearing, and all the things that perhaps we'll hear in some quarters, maybe in the, next, in the next few hours. But certainly, the first one, the modern cow, and Andrew talked a little bit about the cow of the future, but we talk about this modern cow, and in some quarters at least, that means modern cow is a cow that's bred to milk. And the, 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 the next thing that's said in, in, in the next breath is, that cow must be fed to milk. And there's nobody at, at any point is disagreeing that a cow has to be bred or has to be fed to meet the requirements. But it's just interesting if you look back through the literature. The first time I could find it, at least, that there was talk of this modern cow that needed to be fed accordingly, I came across a paper in the Journal of Dairy Science from 1928, before the Great Depression, they were talking about the modern cow that needed to be fed. So there's nothing new about the idea of feeding cows to their potential. Okay? Breeding a cow that responds well to feeding, that's something else you might hear. Breeding a cow that's high volume for limited land bases. Um, we also maybe have some people that might perceive that a grazing system or a high forage system doesn't work well in this region. Now we've loads of farms and farmers in the room that are proving that's not the case actually. Um, it should be in winter milk because of heavy soils. And that's one that I'd be hearing quite a bit, seeing as I do work a lot in winter milk. But I'd be questioning the validity of that. And we'll come back to all these things in, in a moment. The other great one, and it was alluded earlier on, was the whole issue of fertility. That it's not really down to breeding, it's more down to feeding and management. I think, and Andrew has showed a bit of it, and I'll, I'll probably come back on it in a second and show why that wouldn't be the case. The issue of recycling cows, you know, extending lactations, allowing cows to stay in the herd in a non-seasonal system. You know, in some cases people would perceive that as a way to get over a fertility issue. And maybe in the non-seasonal systems, there has been a tradition of uh, recycling cows. And I think we need to look at what that actually means for our whole farm business. But just to, to summarise what I would take in a lot of those things, I would be given that type of thinking, the red card. Good man, Dick. I don't know how many red cards Dick has got this time, but that's Dick. <laughs> but certainly, I think red card for any of that type of thinking. We need to move to a different type of, a different way of thinking. And some of the reasons why I think that, that the red card should be shown in these conditions. First of all, and I think I've shown this slide numerous times before, you know, we talk a lot about milk team, and I think in the, in the, in the context of, of uh, quote being abolished, you know, some people would perceive that as being a license to just straightforward increase in milk per cow. And I think we could be on a dangerous road if that's where we go. Okay? Because we've seen it in the past, and I know we're talking to, to our you know our colleagues or our counterparts in, in, in Northern Ireland and the experience there, they have seen in a non covid situation, in a lot of cases, extra milk being produced at farm level. It's not difficult to get more milk from cows. You just feed them more constantly. 
There was no achievement in, in increasing our milk use per cow. It's simple. It's, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Feed them more concentrate, you get more milk. The question becomes, how can we do it more profitably? Okay? And what, what this slide is basically showing is from data from the 300 uh, dairy farms, spring milk and winter milk over a long number of years uh, in, in the Republic of Ireland, it's shown that milk yields doesn't really explain much in terms of profitability per litre. But the amount of milk that you produce from forage, or the amount of milk that you can produce from your own resources, that silage, or more specifically grazed grass, the more of that milk you can produce from that resource, that's the key, really, the key driver of improving your overall profitability. The other thing that's important to say at this juncture is that, you know, we hear a lot that maybe it's down to the cost of feeding cows over the winter by some farmers in high feed costs, or it's down to, you know, wetland or this or that. But I think, and it's clear from a lot of farms we look at over, over a number of years, um, it's actually how grass is managed in the spring and how grass is managed in the autumn. If you get off to a good start in the year in terms of grazing management, and if you set the farm up correctly in the autumn period, you can significantly reduce your feed costs, irrespective of whether uh, you're on heavy land or dry land, irrespective of, it, of whether you're in winter milk or spring milk. And all of the things that Bertie alluded to earlier on in terms of farm infrastructure are hugely important at the shoulders of the year when grazing is a challenge. And what you're looking at on the slide there, the black line and the, 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 the lighter coloured line, is just the pattern of how high cost farms and low cost farms from a feed perspective use supplement throughout the season. And what we can see is basically the high cost farms are consistently putting in extra feed all throughout the season, except maybe for a month or two in the middle of the summer. But certainly in the spring and the autumn, there is an addiction to feed, which I don't think is simply down to trying to feed cows better, but I think in some cases it may be down to maybe a lack of, um, a, a lack of grass on the farm, maybe just <coughs> some issues in terms of grazing management. And the, the, set, the final thing I'd like to make in terms of looking at these myths in terms of around where the modern cow should be. And it's back to maybe what Andrew spoke about a few moments ago. This is just showing a slide that there's about 4,000 cows on this slide from uh, about 50 different winter milk herds in the Loud and Mead region. And what it's basically showing is how long, how long does it take your cows within these herds to calve for the fourth time? Okay? Because in spring milk systems, it's very straightforward and very simple. If you have poor fertility, cows are culled as present at the end of the season. In winter milk systems, there's a tendency to recycle cows. Okay? And that kind of masks the issue of fertility to some degree. But when we went in and we looked at uh, data from high yielding herds in the, in the northeast region, and we picked out cows that were a high fertility index or versus a low fertility index, what we did see was that these cows are now fed the same, bred the same, managed the same, milked the same, everything is consistent. They're just, you know, herd mates within the same yard. And what we do see was that on the higher EBR, the higher index animals for fertility in red, uh, about 65% of those calf down for a fourth time. On the low fertility group, in terms of the genetics, only 29% of those made it to fourth lactation. But another interesting point on it is that of the low fertility index cows that survived in these herds, it took them almost a year longer to calf for the fourth time. Okay? So that's a critically important point, that recycling cows and using extended lactation masks an issue on fertility. And genetics is key to that, because as I say, there's no difference in feed management between these groups. Now, the effect that that has on milk yield is actually huge at farm level. So if you look at this, this is just showing you your calving interval is along the bottom here. So an average calving interval of say 400 days up to 485 days, all expressed relative to your target of around 370 days. And whether it's a 6,000 litre herd, a 7,000 litre herd, or an 8,000 litre herd, the effect is pretty much the same. As calving interval increases, the amount of milk you actually sell declines. So we see in a lot of these herds where we have loads of milk potential in the, in the cows, but because fertility index is poor, these cows are not calving enough, they're not spending enough time in lactation, they're spending too many days dry, and the actual milk delivered, the actual milk that's sold from these farms is an awful lot less than it should be, and it's simply down to a base of fertility. Okay? So, I would say what our modern dairy systems actually need are a couple of things like this. 
we certainly need high fertility genetics, and that's, as Andrew showed, EBI is the key to that. Control of calving patterns, and that will come from a high genetic base. High milk solids from a forage based diet, so not simply milk yield, but high milk solids, specifically protein, but also fat. The capacity to do that from a forage based diet. Uh, correct soil fertility is a huge issue. Um, I'm just pointing these out, I can't go into detail on them all, but soil fertility is a massive issue in, in order of what we need to look at for our modern dairy system. Grazing infrastructure, as Bertie has already come to, but these are the two maybe I want to focus on for just a few moments, is the whole issue of sensible supplementation and understanding the basics of nutrition. I think that's important for grazing herds as well as for sort of more intensive herds or high income herds. We need to understand the principles of nutrition first. And finally, maybe just to the top with this whole issue of secure feed stocks. And maybe if you do a few of those things, you might get a better result than a red cow. All right. So look at very quick run through basic nutrition guidelines, and I don't want to get bogged down in for diet formulation and all the rest, but I just want to go through some quick points, okay? And the first point I want to make is this, that there are hundreds of ingredients out there, and I think sometimes we get wrapped up in worrying about one ingredient versus the other, okay? And I've just broken them into, I've just broken them into a, sort of a, as best I can, into different grades, okay? We can see in terms of concentrate, we have our energy feeds, we have our protein sources, we have our digestive fiber sources, and we have some low-grade feed sources as well on the, on the right. Our forages go across the center. Then we have our byproducts and our co-products, which would be things like, you know, all the, all the alternative feeds like molasses, potatoes, QLA, all of these other things that are available. And finally, the additives in terms of minerals, vitamins, uh, you know, all of those, those type of things. Now, I think when we think nutrition, a lot of the time, our thoughts go to the top line or the bottom two lines and we don't spend enough time thinking about the lines in the center. Because this is where, this is where nutrition actually, the nutrition of the hair, the correct nutrition of the hair, actually happens in, in the piece that's ringed in red there. It's what the quality of the grass is like, what the quality of the silages are like. All of these other issues around, you know, different types of feeds, they become secondary in my opinion. And I know that the plow match is only around the corner and every year we stand at the plow match answering questions about what are we going to feed you the same as you found last one, probably. That's probably a good idea. Okay, and I have a very simple rule of thumb with all these things. If you've never heard of the feed before, don't feed it. <laughs> right? If you've never heard of it before, don't feed it. There are enough options. Everything you need is on the board. There are no need for all these additional complications. Keep it bloody simple. It's a simple rule, and I think it works well. All right? So, we just come to see what the effect now of you know, we need to look at the forage quality. And again, I'm stressing, I don't want to go into details on, on diet formulation, but if we're looking at balanced diets, it's energy that's the key. Energy, energy, energy. But we tend, to, we tend as, a, as a group of farmers, as a country, we tend to put our emphasis on protein. You know, we always do it. We do it. When we ring up the merchants to buy concentrate, what do we ask? We ask, what's the current protein? What's the cost? And third question in the delivery before the weekend. And that's usually a Friday evening at five o'clock. Right? But we never ask about energy. Energy is what drives the system. Protein is, in our systems at least, it's relatively straightforward, it's relatively cheap. We have plenty of grazed grass with high protein in it. We have, it's not difficult to supplement with protein. Soya is an excellent source. It covers, you can balance diets with protein quite easily, but it's the energy that's the key. Okay? Now, when we took energy, okay, we can buy energy, but I think it's more important that we look at how much energy can we actually produce on our own farm. <coughs> if we produce high quality grass, we get more energy. If we produce high quality silage, we get more energy. Okay, so the digestibility of your forages is what really is the key to getting more energy into your systems, okay? So, th there's a balance here between fiber and energy. Of course, we need to drive up energy at and keep fiber low. I know loads of farmers who worry all the time about having, have I enough fiber in the diet? Adding in straw, have I enough fiber in the diet? We need to start worrying about having too much fiber in the diet. If we're making poor quality silage, if we're making poor quality grass, we have too much fiber in the diet. Start worrying about having too, having a balance rather than worrying about having too much, okay? The protein issue, 
we, we want to move people away from using crude protein as a measure of feed quality. It's not a good measure of feed quality. We would prefer using the system. We use the PDI system. I don't want to go into the details of that, but we'll come to it maybe in a little more detail in a moment. And obviously minerals and vitamins. A huge part of the diet is minerals and vitamins. Hundreds and hundreds of questions about minerals and vitamins. It's relatively straightforward to supplement with minerals and vitamins. Okay? And I know some farmers have particular issues, but it's not, I think we get 90% of our queries on minerals and vitamins when it may be 10% of our problems. We need to refocus there and come back to the energy question. So look at, just to give you some idea, again, all our feeds that we talked about before, we know what the energy content of, of them are, we know what the protein content over on the right hand side is what we would use, the PDIE system, which measures how much protein the animal actually gets from its diet, rather than looking at crude protein, which is simply a measure of the nitrogen content. But the main point, and that's the one thing I'd like to take away from today, is look at the difference in energy between high quality leafy grass and stemmy grass. Look at the difference in energy between high quality silage and poor quality silage. There's three litres, four litres of difference there. Okay? Now, we can buy all the energy we want, but how much of it can we produce ourselves? That's where we need to be looking. Okay? Now, and that, that is summed up, I think, on this slide. We have to exploit it. That, that's the code curve from the Valley Hills herds, just out the road, uh, just about 10 miles from here. They're producing 14, 14 and a half tons of dry matter of high quality material for every hectare of ground every year. That has to be exploited. And some people argue, well, that's because it's a spring milk system and all the rest of it. But in a winter milk system, the challenge is fairly simple. We move the surpluses in the summer to produce high quality feed in the winter. It's as simple as that, really. But it's back, how much can we get from our own resources? Okay, now, a couple of diets, just to give you some quick points. And again, we can, we can argue the toss when we questions. But this is a, the type of diet that we would feed for the Johnstown herd, for the winter milk herd that we'd be uh, working with in Wexford, which is producing around 7,000 litres of a little over a tonne of concentrate, okay? The key points here are, we're not worried about the individual ingredients per se, we're more worried about the composition of the diet overall. We're looking for, you know, a high energy content here, is that, that's measured as the UFL, that's a high energy content, moderate protein, well balanced for protein, and enough fibre to keep the room in, um, keep your room working, which is not that difficult. So typically for us it would be, you know, eight to nine kilos dry matter, high quality silage, maybe four kilos of whole crop, a blend, a simple blend of high quality ingredients, and then maybe four to five kilos of par. That could be as simple as high quality silage plus meal of par. I have no problem with that at all. There are the key points. Focus on the balance of the diet. Focus on the energy content. Moderate protein, not high protein, I think is the way to go. In this case, under this system, we would balance the diet for about 29, 30 litres. There's enough energy there for 30 litres, there's enough protein there for 30 litres. We're not asking cows to milk, you know, milk off the bags, certainly. And maybe an important point, our ADF and NDF are just simply two measures of fibre. We would use them as our simple measure of fibre, which is internationally the standard thing to do. So, in our case, even with high quality silage and, high, and lots of concentrate perhaps going in, there is no need in this case to add additional fibre. I think what we misconstrued the question. If you have high quality silage, you can feed as much meal as you like, I think. We've regularly fed up to 10 kilos of concentrate in the farm. If you have high quality silage, you will encourage intake of forage. You will encourage intake of fibre. Okay, so I think sometimes we look at it the wrong way around. We say, you know, if we have poor quality silage, then we have to up our concentrate. That becomes risky. If we make high quality silage in, for a winter milk situation, we certainly can, we can get away with an awful lot in terms of what we can feed in the power. Now, just to, to be clear, we're not all about the indoor situation. And nutrition is not entirely the, the realm of the indoor situation. It's critically important in an early spring situation, or even mid-season for spring, uh, grazers as well. This would be fairly standard as to what Bally Hayes would do in the first rotation uh, for grazing, maybe starting on the 8th of, 5th to the 8th of February. With grass, some good quality grass silage, and maybe 3 to 4 kilos of concentrate. In that situation, in a very simple, in a very simple makeup of the diet, 
that, and that's supporting around 27 litres. The protein in the diet is supporting 27 litres. So I think we need to be clear, cows on grass can be well fed on grass. They have adequate fibre, they have plenty of energy, they have plenty of protein. It's not about nutrition indoors, grass management outdoors. The two things can exist in tandem. And the principles we talk about, they hold for both systems alike. Okay? Now, a few quick points on feed budgeting. And I'd like to break feed budgeting into sort of tactical feed budgeting, if you want to call it that, versus looking at the whole farm. Okay? And what I mean by tactical feed budgeting, these are the day-to-day -day decisions. Right? The whole farm feed budget covers things like stocking rate, cropping decisions, all of those type of things. But we still need to decide how much grass we allocate the cows today. You know, what percentage of the farm we need to graze this week? What should our pre-grazing yield be? How much of our, uh, how, how much of, what percentage of the farm should we have closed by the 1st of November? Okay, and my simple point, all I want to make, the, all I want, the point I want to make here is that across the range of systems that exist for, you know, for this region or for grazing systems as a whole, you know, the tools are there. The tools are there that just need to be implemented better. Okay? It's the same as what Andrew spoke about in the breeding or what, what Bertha spoke about earlier on in the infrastructure. The knowledge is there and the way to do things is, is understood. It's a case of implementing them and farming them. And I'm just making a quick comparison here between the Ballyhay system, which is a spring cabin herd doing around 5,500 metres, all calving in February, March, April, versus our system in Johnstown, which is a winter calving herd calving 60% of the autumn with the remainder in the spring, doing around 7,000 metres. So two quite different systems, but in both, in both cases, we both use the spring rotation plan to, to identify how much grass we use in the spring. So the, the technologies or the, the techniques we use to manage grass in the spring are common between the two systems. In mid-season, we both use the, the wedge or the, the grass budgeting software in order to allocate grass in the summer period. Now we, can, we don't want to go into the details of all of these things, but the technology is there, and I think it would be important to seek it out if we're, if, if we're serious about it. So the wedge is common to both systems. It's not about managing the farm differently because we have a different calving pattern or slightly different uh, higher yield or whatever. We both systems today are using the wedge on this very day using the wedge to, to make their decisions. The one difference we would have, I suppose, is we'd make an area silage cut for quality. Both systems use an autumn grass budget. Okay? Our targets might be slightly different, but the template for how we manage grass is consistent. All right? And finally, we would use the, our, own, our own programs based on energy content and protein. In the spring system, it's to make sure that the dry cow diet is correct. In our winter system, we use the very same program to make sure that both the dry cow diet and the lactation diet are correct. So I think if we used the spring rotation plan, the wedge, the grass budget, or the autumn grass budget, and, the, and that simple use of energy and protein balance, we cover a huge range of systems in terms of nutrition. The details come after that, and that's farm by farm. Okay, quick, uh, a couple of quick messages on whole farm feed budgeting uh, before we just finish up, okay? The first thing is, and it's back to first principles, what we talked about in terms of energy. You know, we have a whole range of things affecting um, we have a whole range of things affecting the whole farm feed budget. That could be stocking rates, it could be grass growth potential, soil fertility, whether the farm is fragmented or not, all of these type of issues. But the most important thing maybe is to start, if we just go back and we start with the individual cow and we work from there, we can see what the actual whole farm feed budget, how it will end up. And this red line here just simply represents what the feed demand would be for uh, around the 6,000 litre cow calving in, in, in February. You can see low energy in the spring period when she's uh, dry, peaking then as you, as you go through, and then towards the end of the year, you can see it's tailing off again. So you can, that's typically what you would see then. Uh, and that, we don't recognize this end in spring milk. You can see in yellow there is the dry cow diet, a bit of milk and cow silage in the spring, uh, grass to meet most of the demand through the summer, maybe a kilo concentrate on top of that, and additional grass may be being fed uh, in the autumn period. But that, if you calculate it on first principles, or you do it in reality, that's where you end up, okay? That's what the budget for one cow would look like. But all of these other issues in terms of 
as I said, lactation, length, herd size, all of these things feed in at a whole farm level. Okay, so for example, um, that's what the feed budget for an 80 cow spring cow and herd would look like. You can see what feed is needed through the spring. It looks very similar to the single cow because the calving pattern is so tight. Okay, but it's easy to predict forward how much feed you would actually need, need in this situation. All right, you're talking about half a ton of concentrate per cow, maybe 1.3, 1.4 tons dry matter of silage, and the remainder coming from grazed grass. Okay, so in a winter milk situation, it might be slightly different. Um, you would have more concentrate going in, and perhaps more silage, and um, more silage coming in for the milking cow. But we have programs now that will allow us to do this for each farm situation. You can plug in your own situation and it'll tell you, give you an idea of where your budget should look. Okay? The important point I suppose is that you should just make on this is that when we're looking at what drives the feed demand on the herd, these are all cow type issues, or we're managing cows when we're looking at this, right? Our decisions on breed type, our decisions on yield level, our decisions on age of first calf. Live weight, culling policy, calf and calf. We're managing the herd when we're, that's what drives feed demand, right? And that's how we end up with our demand. But on the other side of the equation is our feed supply. We need to nearly wear a different hat when we're talking feed supply. Now we're crop farmers, and we need to start thinking of it in that way. We're now managing crops, we're managing grass quality, we're managing growth rates, we're managing soil fertility, we're managing growth patterns, all of these type of things. That dictates our feed supply. So, and alluded to earlier, I think Bertie mentioned earlier with the range in um, forage production per hectare. There's a massive range out there, and I think it really makes a nonsense of all this discussion of stock in the way, because it all depends on what the grass can grow on an individual hectare. You can see that's just the range of growth rates, individual growth rates. You can see the light green one there is the farm growing around eight and a half tons of dry matter. Massive deficit in overall feed production relative to perhaps more carp or, or valley gains. So there's a huge gap in. Yep. So I just want to make one quick point before we wind up, and that's how does um, stop rate and changes in growth rate affect the feed budget? And this is an important point just to finish um, for those of you that's considering expansion. Okay. We just take very simply our standard 100 cow herd, right, on stocked at two and a half cows per hectare. And this would be typically what the feed budget would like look like. On a high growth rate, and just focus in on, on this, just focus in on this imported silage. You can see it's there at zero. In a situation where you're on your 100 cows, stock to 2.5 cows per hectare, there is no requirement for imported silage. Okay? If we're growing 11 tons on the same farm, our deficit in silage is 50 tons of dry matter, which is the equivalent of around 300 tons in the pit. So the difference between growing 14 tons and growing 11 tons is that we're short 300 tons of silage for 100 cows. Okay? My worry and my concern for the next couple of years is when we start looking at doing something like this, putting 128 cows or 130 cows on the same area. In that situation, even with the high growth rate, we will be short 73 tons of important silage, which is the equivalent of around 400 tons, 450. If we push the growth rate or the stock rate up and only grown 11 tons, we're now short 143 tons of dry matter, which is the equivalent of around 800 tons of silage. Right? So carrying 28 cows and an extra and your, and your growth rate dropping back, it's the difference in needing no silage or needing 7 to 800 tons of silage. And just to bring that home in terms of how many hectares we would need extra outside the farm, outside the grazing block to balance the feed budgets. If we're at moderate stocking rate and a high growth rate, we need around 12 hectares to, to, to feed our heifers. Okay, that 13 hectares is there just to feed the young stock. And um, if we're on, if we push it to the extreme right, where we push the stocking rate up, but if we do that without a high growth rate, we will require 35 hectares over and above what we have for grazing. So we need the same size of the farm again. All right. All I'm saying is. Be careful when we're making our decisions and be realistic, be very realistic in terms of the stock carrying capacity. There could be huge deficits there if we don't get a handle on what grass we're growing and if we're not sensible in terms of where we want to push the stock rate. Get the grass growing first, then think about the stock rate decision set. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, Joe.